Keon Dooling here at Google to talk about his personal experience with mental health, um, what, and then what the NBA is doing because he is a former NBA basketball player. Um, so a little bit about Keon, who we are very lucky to have with us today. He was born in Florida and attended the University of Missouri, where he was the 10th overall pick in the NBA draft in 2000. Uh, definitely a good draft year. Yeah, solid. <laughs> um, he played for seven NBA teams, so he knows a lot about the NBA, including the Clippers, which are obviously based here in LA, uh, and the Celtics, who are still in the playoffs right now. Go Celtics. Um, and now he's currently serving on, in the NBA Players Association as a player rep. Um, he also is an author, a motivational speaker, and the founder of the co-founder of the Respect Foundation with, with his wife. And he's doing a lot of work in um, the mental health awareness um, community. So we are very lucky to have him here. So thank you for being here. MJ, thank you for that kind introduction. Um, so just to get started, I thought it would be useful for the group to hear a little bit more about your personal background and why mental health is so important to you. So I grew up in a, uh, a little town called Fort Lauderdale, Florida, and um, <clears throat> I grew up in an era where uh, we knew our neighbors. Um, we could go and knock on the door and borrow some sugar. Um, but also, you know, during that time in the 80s, you know, crack hit. And so um, I saw my community go from, you know, being this uh, united uh, community where you could go and borrow sugar and you knew all the neighbors to, um, you know, really like a war zone. Um, and so my upbringing was awesome. Um, I, I'm a, I come from a two-parent two household. Uh, my father worked for himself. We had a florist, so we had a family business. And he also used to sky cap at Eastern Airlines for my 80 babies. And my mother was an educator um, for a great part of her life. She was a teacher. And during the 80s, she, sh she switched careers to go uh, as a drug counselor mm -hmm. because of the epidemic. It hit our family, it hit our neighborhood. And so she was passionate about it. And um, she became a drug treatment counselor. And so that's a little bit of background. I'm the youngest of four. Um, and yeah, that's a little bit about me. Cool. Um, so what is your personal experience with mental health? Like why? Why are you spending your time now that you don't have much free time right. of promoting this awareness work? So I was forced um, to deal with my mental health issues. Um, I, I went through, you know, a, a few tragedies um, as a child. Um, the, at the heart of it, I was sexually abused when I was seven years old, and I had never really, you know, dealt with that. I took that into my adulthood, and so um, in my twelfth year in the NBA. Um, I was doing some some charity work in Seattle, Washington, and I was using the restroom and a guy felt on me while I was in the restroom and it triggered me. And so all these things, you know, that I had pretty much, you know, uh, pushed down, compressed. Um, I was going to, you know, lock the door and throw away the key and not ever have to deal with um, some of those experiences. Um, but in that moment, I got triggered and that barrier, that block that I put up in my mind to block it out came tumbling down and I was forced to deal with uh, this um, intense, intense um, battle with PTSD. And so um, in doing my work and, and overcoming that um, is when I became a mental health advocate. And I felt like I found a recipe for healing um, and I'm vulnerable enough to share that experience so that others may benefit from it so, they don't, so that they don't have to hit rock bottom in order to build themselves up. Yeah, it's so brave of you for sharing that story Thank you. as well. Thank you. Um, and what you just mentioned um, is something that you've spoken about publicly in the yeah, past. Sure. And one question that, that I've had in just getting to know you a little bit is that was that the first time that you acknowledged that you did have PTSD? Yeah, yeah. Um, for me, you know, uh, the symptoms of being abused as a child and seeing gunshots and things like that as a child. Um, it didn't really, I never allowed myself to feel it. Um, the way it would come out is with my behaviors um, and in my emotions. And so I suffered from anxiety, you know, um, in my childhood quite a bit, and I took that into adulthood. Um, that's one of the ways that, you know, it kind of manifested. Um, I had anger issues at different points in my life. Um, I think it made me overcompensate and become more macho mm -hmm. because, you know, when, when something um, happens to you as a child, um, you know, you, you, you build up these walls. 
Um, another thing in my behaviors, you know, being promiscuous early in life is something that I, you know, had to overcome. Um, but the PTSD didn't manifest until I was triggered, you know, uh, uh, at 32 years old. Um, so I was able to manage the anxiety, mm -hmm. self-care, you know. Um, but when I got triggered, like those, those little techniques that I had, they were out of the door because that was too powerful for those little mild techniques to mm -hmm. work on. So can you talk a little bit more about how you actually went about confronting that you did have PTSD, especially being an NBA athlete at that time. Yeah. This is now six years ago, and there today, luckily, there are athletes coming out like Kevin Love and DeMar DeRozan yeah. publicly about their own experiences, yes. but at the time, you were probably the first one to really be, to openly discuss it. So can you talk about what barriers you had to overcome in terms of addressing that stigma and still being able to successfully yeah. play in the NBA? Yeah, so I would say the first thing, you know, um, the stigma is that I was embarrassed. I was ashamed um, because my abuse came at the hands of a man. Um, I was seven years old. He was about 14, 15 years old at that time. Um, I was really ashamed about that, really embarrassed about that. Um, so I decided, you know, uh, at a very early age that I just wouldn't tell anybody, you know, and so... Um, you know, I just really wanted to, um, uh, how do I say it? Like, when you're young, you don't understand. Mm -hmm. You know, there was no examples of where to go to heal. Um, when I was looking around for examples of, you know, um, men who had been through some of the things that I had to, had to overcome, I didn't see a lot of examples. And so I know I wanted to be an example for people um, once I built myself up. Um, but yeah, it was a tough situation. Um, I'm actually glad that I went through it, that I got triggered, that, that I had to battle PTSD because if I had not, I would probably still have some of the same behaviors. Mm -hmm. um, you know, my anxiety would still probably be, be through the roof. Um, so it forced me to do my work. But what I want to tell everybody else is that you don't have to be forced to do your work. You can actually take the step to start doing your work, to start building yourself up. And I always say that the first step uh, of healing is really embracing the pain in the mm -hmm. first place. And that's the first step. Yeah, exactly. And now you are the example for a lot of people. So hopefully you, just you being open about your experience and getting help and what that has done for you will help others in similar situations be able to take that first step without the trigger. Absolutely, because you know when you get triggered, you know, uh, it's a very vulnerable time, and you don't know how you'll react to that trigger. It's so, you know, if I would have gone out and gotten help, um, you know, actively, I probably would have never had to deal with PTSD. I probably would have been able to, you know, um, catch it, you know, learn the tools and the techniques to be able to manage it. Um, but for me, you know, um, I just didn't embrace mental health. I didn't know what it looked like. Um, I didn't see many examples of people, you know, uh, going to therapy. Mm -hmm. And so um, I'm, I'm, I've, I've also, I also was very successful at mm -hmm. every intersection in life. Um, I had like to bust through and break through and become. And a lot of times when you're successful and you're climbing, you don't get to process what you've experienced, especially as athletes. We don't necessarily get to process what we've seen, what we've been through, what we've encountered. Um, the punishment that we put our bodies through, and so we internalize um, our pain, our issues. We 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 mask it, and so um, I didn't want to do that anymore. You know, I felt like you know, in order for me and my family to get to the next level, I had to heal. Um, I feel like I kind of ran away from basketball. I didn't play with PTSD because I didn't think I was strong enough. I didn't know what I was experiencing, mm -hmm. so I decided to retire from the NBA um, to, to to get myself healthy. Yeah, and that's the most important thing for sure. So when you did confront that you were experiencing PTSD, what are some of the things that did help you kind of get back to a healthy place? Well, I, I don't think it was one thing that helps me on a daily basis. And I say, uh, I say it in the present tense because I'm still healing. And I believe like I'll be healing the rest of my life. And so I had to learn these tools to be able to manage all these different emotions. As men, a lot of times we can resonate with like pleasure and anger. And you know, there's so many emotions in between that. And in doing the therapy process and in going through the healing process, I was able to like identify and recognize all these emotions that as a man, I never allowed myself to feel. Perfect example, as men, a lot of times we're told to shut up, suck it up, be tough. 
when the first natural language that we speak is a cry. If you're not crying, they'll smack you on the butt and make sure you cry because that's normal. We have these tear ducts that produce water that you know allows us to cry, but we are so, we're told a lot of times as men to suck it up. Um, and so for me, I wanted to make sure that I understood my emotions, I understood my triggers, I understood you know what I'm grappling against so that I can have the best recipe, the best tools, the best resources to be able to take care of myself, not just uh, for a short time, but over the course of time, over the course of my life, and then also generationally. I think you know a lot of times families, we pass down negative stigmas to our kids. And so uh, in regards to mental health, you know the way that it's talked about, a shrink, a head doctor, you're crazy, all these different negative uh, words that we associate with mental health and if we just shift that up, you know, mm -hmm. if we shift it a little bit and, you know, uh, have the right word magic around it, um, we could really, we could really destigmatize mental health and really treat it uh, for what it's worth. Yeah, you made a great point in just like the conversation with men specifically with the stigma attached. And I think every different group, whether it's your family or where you're from or the type of job that you're in has a slightly different stigma attached to it. Mm -hmm. And that's obviously why these types of events are so critical in helping us all come together to open up this dialogue because we're all experiencing different types of mental health. Um, so can you, kind of going back to your support system, which did allow you to access treatment without saying, Keon, suck it up, you're a man. Right. Can you talk a little bit about your support system through this experience? and? what types of things they did that were helpful. There are a lot of people here and probably watching um, that are either experiencing PTSD themselves or have friends, family, coworkers who are. So like, how can we su be supported and support each other? I, th I would say the first thing is um, my family. My family really supported me through what I was going through. Um, they knew I was going through something. We just didn't know what it was. We didn't understand what PTSD was, um, but they knew something was going on with me. Um, and they didn't run away. They didn't hide. They leaned in and they made sure that I got the right resources. They made sure that they protected me um, around that. And another thing, a lot of times we'll internalize things because we don't think people will understand or our infrastructure is not there to help us, love us, support us. And I was so wrong about that. Um, the Boston Celtics, man, were there for me. Danny Ainge, Doc Rivers, Rajon Rondo, Avery Bradley, all of my teammates, they were there for me. And a lot of times we think when we're struggling with something, um, we're in it by ourselves. And what I learned through this process is that when I, when I needed my village to be there for me, um, that village was there for me. And I'm so thankful and so grateful for all the resources that the NBA and the Players Association had in place um, because that played a big part in my healing all the love and support that I got from my Celtics family, all the love and support that I got from my, um, my friends. And that combination allowed me to uh, give myself permission to heal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so do you, kind of going back to your teammates, do you still keep in touch with them? Absolutely. I mean, not everybody, everybody is so busy and those guys, a lot of them are still playing and being excellent. Um, but yeah, I have great relationships with my friends. Now also, I did lose some friends in this process. Um, mental health is so misunderstood that, you know, people will, you know, tar and feather you. They'll, they'll isolate you and they'll make you feel like, you know, uh, like you have an issue and they might not be comfortable with that. Um, but what I'll say is like, if, we, if, if, if I have a knee issue, I'm gonna try and go to the best surgeon to get it repaired. If I have uh, an issue with my teeth, I'm gonna go to the best dentist to get it prepared. But where do you go when your heart and your head is you know, out of whack or you're feeling emotional about something? Where do you go? And for years, you know, I would go to you know, maybe a glass of wine or you know, um, try and distract myself another way. But therapy, <laughs> Therapy to me was a place where I really, really got a lot of healing. I spent four days in a mental institution. And for me, I didn't get healing there, um, but I got the epiphany there that I needed to do my work. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that, you know, I appreciate that experience for that alone. But the therapy process, in three weeks of therapy, I was able to um, dump off about 25 years of baggage that I had been holding on to, that I had never processed, allowed myself to feel, um, that I was still carrying. And every time I would go to therapy and I would drop off some of this baggage, I would feel a little lighter when I came out. 
you know, I would go back the next, way, the next day and I would drop off some of that baggage and I would feel a little lighter. And it wasn't just the uh, cathartic experience of, of dropping off the baggage, but it was the tools that I was able to get from my therapist to be able to manage that emotion, to be able to identify that emotion. And so I started more uh, maturing more emotionally. It's called emotional maturity. And um, I'm so thankful that, you know, through the therapy process that I, I learned how to process things. Yes, therapy is one of the best things that we can do to maintain our mental health and to improve it. Um, but you mentioned the tools that your therapist gave you. Can you talk a little bit about like any specific tools that have helped you yeah. maintain kind of on a daily Absolutely. basis? Absolutely, because the same plan that I got from my therapist six years ago is the same plan that I'm working um, with a few tweaks here and there. Um, but I take a holistic approach. Um, I believe in... Um, the mental, the physical, the spiritual, and the emotional part of health, right? Holistic health. And so the first place that I started was in my spiritual experience, you know, um, praying, you know, talking to the Lord and just, you know, getting that, uh, that, that connection point. Um, the second thing that I did from there, um, excuse me, from, you know, getting my, my prayer life together and making sure that I talked with God and consulted with him first. Um, but the next thing I did was therapy. <laughs> therapy to me was like the biggest gateway for healing. It was unbelievable, you know, what I was able to accomplish in the therapy process, what I was able to learn about myself, um, where I was able to tr uh, trace some of the origins of my behavior and my trauma. Um, and it's very difficult. The most difficult thing about therapy is going, mm -hmm. taking that first step. Once I got in there, um, it was just a very awesome experience. Um, and then physical. Um, I'm an athlete, you know, and so I believe that, like, you know, it all, mind, body, spirit, it all kind of works together. And so I still have a, you know, a, a, a physical routine that I do five, six times a week. Um, I implemented yoga into that. Um, I go get treatment on my body. I have two degenerative hips. And so I do a lot of things to make myself feel good. I get mm -hmm. massages. I learned about essential oils. I'm on no prescription drugs. Um, but I take a lot of natural things. I like herbs and I like essential oils and I like different things like that, chamomile tea and things mm -hmm. that help me relax. And so I had to learn how to, um, you know, I had to learn my system. And, you know, it's not for everyone. You know, I think everybody has, it's no blueprint for success. There's many blueprints for success. And you have to find out what your interests are, um, you know, where your pride is and where your, uh, pr excuse me, where your prizes are in regards to health. Yeah. And that's what I did. I explored it. I still explore it. I still get therapy. I still work out. I still try and eat right. And I just try. And if I have an off day, I don't internalize it. Mm -hmm. I talk about it. I talk about it with my therapist. I talk about it with my family. We've created an environment in my family where it's OK for us to talk about mental health. And so we have those discussions and we embrace it totally as a family. Yeah, I love your phrase. You learn your system. I think, again, what you were mentioning earlier, for so long, mental health was kind of this taboo thing that wasn't talked about and was thought of, thought to be completely separate of our physical health. But right. in reality, the more research that comes out, the more we understand that everything is intertwined and learning your system is a great way to put it. And like, there will be no one uh, solution that fits everyone because we all are all different and unique and that's awesome. Um, but it's a lot about knowing yourself and finding those ways that you can kind of maintain both aspects of your health. No, absolutely. You know, um, sometimes a video game, playing the video game could help relax me. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes going for a nice little walk can help relax me. I think everybody has to find out like their interests, like what makes, what, what, what allows them to get to their happy place and be able to go back to those places. Also, the, the, the power of visualization. Sometimes I can't go back to Bahamas physically, but I can close my eyes and like visualize that view and <laughs> suck up that air and smell that scent and it'll help, you know? And I think sometimes that mind body experience um, needs to be highlighted. You know, sometimes we, ha as kids, we can imagine things. I remember going to the park as a kid and it would be no scoreboard, no crowd out there, but I'll be having my eyes closed and dueling for the game, three, two, one, and the crowd goes crazy. <sighs> open my eyes, nobody's there, but in that vision, it was real to me. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times with our healing, you know, we have to sometimes visualize ourselves as healthy and then wake up and then take the necessary steps to, to, to find that, that health. Um, but yeah, the power of visualization, I think is awesome too. Yeah. 
Um, luckily, we're not too far from the beach, so you don't have to visualize the Bahamas. We're only a couple away, a couple blocks away from Venice Beach. I know that's right. <laughs> you know what? I got, I got, I got a, uh, some exercise clothes out there. I might have to hit Muscle Beach up, yeah, minus the muscles. Gold's Gym is right outside. <laughs> um, all right, I could talk about your story all day long, and it's extremely powerful and it's brave of you to share that with all of us. But I want to spend some time to talk about the work that you're doing now in the, in the awareness space and. Please. Kind of to start off, what made you take the step from treating yourself and making sure that you're healthy and make the decision that it's important for you to share this and why is it important to you to work on this awareness yeah. stuff? So I got to give my wife some credit. You know, when I was going through my breakdown situation, I, I, I just didn't want to share. I didn't want to tell anybody. I just wanted to heal, get my individual healing and then like, you know, kind of ease back into life. Um, but she challenged me. She said, hey, you know, um, you've gone through this for a reason. And there are so many people who are going through what you're going through. And they might not have the resources that you have. They might not have the access to, you know, therapy and the right health care and all those different things. And so you got to help people with this. And so I'm so glad she challenged me because also as a man, because I was abused by at the hands of another young man. Um, hey man, I was ashamed about that. And the fact that she didn't judge me and that she didn't look down on me for going through what I went through. Um, the only thing she was mad about is that I didn't um, tell her because she could have helped me heal along the way and that I kept that from her. Um, and so yeah, that, that kind of gave me enough courage to be able to go out and do this work that I'm doing now. I believe the biggest room in all of our houses and all of our, our lives is the room for improvement. The biggest room in our house is the room for improvement. And I want to share what I learned through my processes with the masses so that they can get their healing. And there's so many people who are walking around right now with a big smile on their face, but they might be suffering with anxiety. Mm -hmm. There's so many people who might be walking around looking gorgeous and they might be suffering with depression. There's so many people who are one step away from getting triggered to having a battle with PTSD but they might not even know their triggers. And so I want to be a mirror to each, each person so that they can find healing for themselves through looking at the way that I attacked this healing process. It was not easy. It was not easy. There were some days, there were some parts of myself that I didn't like to see when I peeled back some of those layers in the onion. Um, but in doing that, that's where the accountability comes in. That's where the growth opportunities come in. And so I would encourage anybody right now um, if you're grappling with something, if you don't even know why you have anxiety or why you're angry or why you're isolating, um, man, I really want to challenge you that the first step uh, to healing is embracing the pain. And a lot of times when you embrace the pain, you'll find power in that. You'll find purpose in that. And then you'll be able to help other people who might be grappling or going through the same thing that you're experiencing. Yeah, exactly. Again, none of us are alone in this. We're all experiencing, we all have mental health to deal with. So it's sometimes a very powerful thing is just asking someone, how are they doing? No doubt. Um, so do you want to talk a little bit more about your foundation? Yeah, let's talk about the Respect Foundation. <laughs> so um, the Respect Foundation is, um, you know, a, a 501c3. Um, we believe that we can help eliminate sexual abuse. We believe that we can raise awareness around mental health. Um, I believe the numbers are one out of every four young ladies, one out of every six young men are abused in this country before the age, um, as children, right? And there's about 30% that are like me who don't talk about it. And so I learned in doing my research and doing this work that if we equip our kids and if we equip people with the knowledge, they can help prevent some of these things. And what I mean is like teaching kids, hey, what is a healthy touch? What is healthy dialogue? You know, uh, hey, if something going on in your life, you know, where do you share that with? Just really equipping kids and empowering, and empowering them to not be silent. I think a lot of times um, we're told to, within families, uh, shut up, what happens in this house stays in this house. You know, it never happened. Don't tell anybody our business. And what happens is, you know, these, these cycles continue, not only in our families, but in, in our safe havens and schools and churches and all these places where, where it should be safe havens. So I wanted to make sure that I reached out and I touched kids through my I Am Respect tour. I bring music, I bring artwork, 
I bring spoken word, entertainment. I bring all these different elements um, to kind of distract you a little bit so that we can give you a good positive message and give you some great tools to be able to, you know, help your family maybe, you know, prevent getting abused one day. Mm -hmm. And if you have been abused, abused um, what healing looks like? How does healing look for you? What's the process? What's the steps to heal? And so we wanted to be a resource with our 501c3, the Respect Foundation. That's amazing. Thank you. In all of the different communities that you've gone to, have you seen major differences in the types of stigma that exist amongst different communities across the country? Um, I think mental health is, is, is it's a lot of um, negative stigmas, you know, across the, across, I don't think it's a cultural thing. Um, I think that there's room to grow uh, for every culture around mental health. Um, but I'll speak from my experience as a, as a member of the black community. Um, I think that, you know, less than 6% of black men get therapy. It's a crazy number like that. Less than 6% of us get therapy. And I believe we come from some of the most traumatic experiences in this country. And I believe that there's so much room for healing if we, um, if we start embracing our mental health the way that we have embraced our physical health. Um, and, and if we start, you know, kind of really locking in and diving in and trying to understand our experience, understand what we went through, understand what, what makes us hurt. Um, I think it's a, it's a great opportunity for us to grow and get better and you know, do, a, do, a, do a, a, a better job of just you know, um, fighting that negative stigma of mental health. Um, so yeah, I think it's, it's room to grow for every culture. And I, you know, I'm so glad that I'm a part of this dialogue because mm -hmm. just because I'm, a, from, I'm I'm a black man from the black community. Um, my skills are transferable. Um, I've lived in the suburbs a great part of my life. <laughs> um, and I know that, that there are certain issues that are, doesn't matter if you're in the hood or the suburbs, like an issue is an issue. I tell my kids all the time, because they didn't grow up in a traumatic environment the way that I did, I'm not gonna minimize their experience because mm -hmm. that is real to them. And you know, it's sharing is caring. It's, as long as we show compassion and we share these tools that we learn, um, it's transferable, transferable no matter what uh, culture you're from. Yeah, exactly. And in your work with the foundation, you're obviously com connecting childhood sexual abuse with mental health. Right. How do you see those two things um, working together? What's the relationship between them? Well, I think they go hand in hand because when you, you've gone through trauma, um, there's going to be some mental health issues that come along with that. Um, they say the, the, the top four symptoms for somebody who's been abused, whether it's physical abuse, mental abuse, sexual abuse, or whatever, abuse in general, um, is anxiety, which I suffered from, depression, which at one point in my t life I, I experienced, um, sexual dysfunction, and PTSD. And at some point in my life, I, I struggled with all those different things at different moments in my life. You know, and so it's not just about, um, it's not just about, you know, the mental health, it's about like, how do I get better from it? I think some people get stuck at just saying, hey, I have a, I have, I'm having a, an emotional issue and they choose to not do anything about it. I wanna encourage people to activate their, their faith, activate, you know, their resources because healing awaits you. It's right there, you just have to take it. And the hardest part is getting up and taking that first step and pursuing it. Yeah, and everything that you're doing is making it easier for people to do well, that. I'm trying, MJ. <laughs> yeah. I'm trying. So, I mean, you're sharing your own story, you're working it with your foundation, and you're also working with the NBA Players Association. That's correct. And they, the NBA has been very active in the mental health dialogue yes. this season. Kevin Love has come out openly about a panic attack he had during yes. the game. DeMar DeRozan has talked about his depression. Obviously, you were recently featured in several articles yes. in May. We have a celebrity amongst us, everyone, in case you didn't know. <laughs> I don't know about that. Um, so can you talk a little, and they had just also, um, during the Western Conference Finals, had a, a commercial about mental health yes. that featured both Kevin Love and DeMar DeRozan, yeah. which brought tears of joy to my eyes to see that the message is being sent that it's broadly. It's happening. Yes. It's happening. So can you share a little bit more about what the NBA is doing and potentially like how, when you were a player, how you were supported and how that has kind of evolved over the last five, yeah. six years? So the latest thing that we've done at the NBA Players Association is we've, uh, we're building this program called the Mental Wellness Program. I'm an advisor for the program. And um, basically we're putting the resources in place all across the country 
where guys can get their healing um, outside of just a team concept because a lot of times you know um, in athletics there could be a conflict of interest if you're having if you're grappling with an emotional issue you may not want to go to the team doctor or you know because they could potentially hold that against you so we wanted to create something that was uh, set aside that players could truly get their healing um, in a way where it would be confidential um, and healthy we just really want to meet our guys where they are our guys are young they're talented they're famous they have wealth and Along with that, it's a whole host of issues that come along with mm -hmm. the pressures of being as excellent as they are. So we want to make sure that just like we have the best trainers and we have the best medical doctors and we have the best coaches and the best GMs, we want to make sure also that we have the best resources for their mental health and emotional health. And I'm so glad to be a part of that. Yeah, it's amazing. When you first kind of had this idea, what what, how was it received by everyone else in the organization? Was there excitement? Were there, anyone, were there any camps that weren't interested in uh, setting that? Yeah, well, I, look, I didn't start this discussion about mental health. I helped contribute to it, um, so I don't want to take You're all the credit. Here for sure. I don't want to take all that credit. <laughs> um, but I think that the stigma is changing slowly but surely. You know, I think, you know, six years ago when I had my breakdown, um, I think it was a negative perception around mental health. And I think, you know, um, I wasn't able to get another job because of that, because of the negative stigmas associated with that. Um, there wasn't a lot of people talking about mental health. There wasn't a lot of people who really, you know, were trying to dive into it. But I think, you know, as a country, as a society, I think we're in a place right now where we're ready to have these discussions. And I think so many brave people are, have been telling their stories. And, uh, you know, as athletes, you know, um, you know, we have a lot of visibility, a lot of fame. Um, we also have resources to be able to get behind things that we're passionate about. And I'm so encouraged that these guys are starting to share their stories because there's some really, you know, people see the glory, but they don't see the story. And there's so many stories that guys have to overcome that help them be as excellent as they are on the court. Um, and so I'm just glad to be a part of the dialogue. I think the timing is right. And I'm just happy that DeMar and Kevin Love and the NBA Players Association is giving us this platform to be empowered about mental health. Yeah, so obviously there are a lot of players who are open about it, but around the league, are, do you think that players will be receptive of actually accessing this type of treatment? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. I think our guys, man, are ready to get to the next level. Um, I think, you know, like I said, we have the best trainers, we have the best coaches, we got the, you know, we're very visible. Um, but also, you know, there's a, there's, a, there's a personal growth that I think our guys are ready to pursue. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you're starting to see them, you know, get more educated. You're starting to see them get more business oriented. Um, but now you're starting to see the emotional maturity and guys really trying to, you know, get better as people. Um, deal with their issues in a positive way, make sure that they're, that, that they're not masking their pain um, in a negative way, but they're dealing with their pain in a positive way. And so I think that's gonna translate to society. You know, um, as athletes, I think they have a great platform. They have fans who follow them and appreciate them. And so if they become more awake about their mental health and more aware about their mental health, I think that can translate into, you know, all these great fans who follow us. Yeah, that's a great point and speaks to the power that a lot of NBA athletes have just kind of using their platform for these positive messages. When you think about the evolution of this program and of the state of mental health in the NBA, what do you see success looking like in five years? Like if we sat down here in May of 2023, what story do you want to be telling about the NBA? I want, I want people to say that, hey, you know, those guys, that, that, that league, the NBA, they really normalize mental health. They destigmatize mental health. They treated a mental health issue the same way and with the same love and care that they treated a, a, a physical injury. And, you know, if, if, if they can do it in the NBA, they can do it at Google. If they, do, if they can do it at Google, they can do it in the police department. If they can do it in the police department, they can do it in the teachers union. And it could almost uh, infect our country in a positive way. If we start having these normal talks about mental health, um, man, people can really get their healing. I'm telling you, healing, I, I never thought I could heal from some of the things that I went through. Being abused as a child, growing up in poverty, you know, seeing a, I saw my first gunfight at 11 years old. I saw a gun shootout at 11 years old. 
And um, I just never knew that I could be this happy and this healthy emotionally without having to, you know, uh, get loaded straight up. And um, so I'm just so excited to be a part of this, this dialogue. I'm happy uh, that I'm, I was vulnerable enough six years ago to share my story because if I hadn't have got out in front of it, I wouldn't even have this platform. And a lot of times, you know, when you're finding your purpose and you're finding your mission, it might not be pretty, mm -hmm. the thing that you have to overcome. Some people grapple with addiction. Some people grapple with uh, gambling. Some people grapple with all kind of different things. And I found so much power in overcoming my shortcomings. It's really helped me as a man. Yes, absolutely. Um, I'm just gonna ask a couple of more questions, then I'm gonna open it up to questions live in the room, and also we have some online. But if you, obviously your work is very focused on destigmatizing mental health. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people, unfortunately, are still suffering silently. So if there were someone who is watching or in the room right. who is suffering silently right now, mm -hmm. what would you say to them? What would your piece of advice be? Well, so the first thing, look, I've been there. I've suffered in silence. You know, I didn't talk about my sexual abuse until I had a major breakdown and I was 32 years old at the time. And so 25 years, I suffered in silence. So the first thing I would say is, I understand that. And um, the next thing I would say is, I wish I would have done my work earlier. Um, the hardest part about healing is taking that first step. And I know I've, I'm echoing that message, but it's so hard to, you know, set that appointment to go see that therapist. You know, it's just like, oh, I'm not crazy. Oh, what are people going to think I'm crazy? Oh, you know, man, I got so much healing in doing that. So the first thing is like, you know, embrace the pain, embrace the hurt. The second thing is uh, find examples um, of success stories of people who might have overcome an issue, you know, that you might be struggling with. Um, the next thing I would say is go to therapy, go get your help. If you have a, uh, an issue with your body, I know you go get that checked out. So it's the same thing. If your heart, if your head, if your emotions are out of whack, go to therapy. Um, the last thing I would say is activate your network. A lot of times we don't know how much our network loves us. <laughs> you know, and a lot of times we don't allow people to be friends or be relatives to us when we're going through something. We say, you know, I'll take care of this by myself. Don't self-care when it's about mental health. Get people involved who love you, who you trust, so that they can support you. Because I couldn't be, I couldn't be as healthy as I am without my support system. And so if I'm having an off day and my anxiety is up, like, babe, hey, my anxiety is up a little bit, you know, today. I just wanted to share that with you, you know, so, you know, so you can help me through that. And there's things that the people who love, they'll do for you that, that, that really helps you, you know. And so just don't think you're alone. That's the last thing. Don't think you're alone because when we're alone, we isolate. That's when our mind can get to racing. That's when those negative behaviors um, can come out, mm -hmm. you know. And so just remember you're not alone if you're going through it. Yeah, and absolutely. And if you aren't suffering, sometimes the most powerful thing that you can do is just lend an open ear and ask someone, how are you today? Absolutely. And even if they don't say anything, just knowing that someone is there supporting you can, be, can make a big difference. It, it so everyone, ask the person next to you or when you're going to get your lunch later today how someone else is doing, and we'll all be better off. All right, I'm going to move to questions. Do we have any live in the room? There's a microphone over there if you want to go up. Um, just We have live stream so people can hear. Um, but in the meantime, I'll ask one from online. Dan in San Francisco, hi Dan. Chris Bosch said that if players like Kevin Love continue to speak about their mental health, players will look to exploit that info. Have you talked with Chris about this? Is there currently an on-court culture where mental health should or should not be the subject of trash talk? Go Celtics. I think Dan's a Celtics fan. <laughs> and I'm pretty sure he's wearing a Celtics jersey and wishes he could be here. <laughs> right, right. Uh, well, you know, um, I'm not sure what Chris said, you know, um, but as far as mental health, you know, I don't think, you know, your mental health can be exploited no different from your physical health or, or, or you know, um, when you go on the court, you're, you're focused, um, you're ready to play. Um, but everybody is grappling with something. See, we, 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 we have these negative stereotypes about mental health that is like schizophrenia or it's paranoia. And it's not. Sometimes mental health is very subtle. It might be through anxiety. It might be through there's 30,000 people in here, you know, looking at me and 
you know, I might get stage fright or something like that. That's not, that's not a negative thing. It's just a human, it's a part of the human experience. And so um, I would say that, you know, I don't think you can be exploited for your mental health on the basketball court. When guys are on the court, trust me, if you're on the court in the NBA, you are locked in and you are focused on your, your, your job, your role on the team and trying to win a basketball game and support your family. You're not really thinking about like, hey, you know, how can I get under this guy's skin to make him explode? You know, I think there's a healthy level of respect we have for NBA players amongst one another. We respect each other's craft, and I don't think anybody would try and exploit, you know, um, if somebody's going through something emotionally. Absolutely. Although Chris Paul did shimmy in Steph Curry's face the other day. Yeah, well, that's not that's not a, that's not an emotional attack. That's, that was just an automatic that's just, reflex. You know, that's just you know competition. That's being locked in. That's right. We have a live question. Thanks. So uh, this is kind of related to the previous question, but do you think there's anything about playing in the NBA that makes it harder for those with mental health issues? For example, I guess the constant media pressure, maybe if you miss a free throw, everyone labels you as a choker. There's this drive that you have to win. Otherwise, it's like a failure of a season. Yeah, man. Great question. I think NBA players and professional athletes and not just professional athletes, I would say, you know, uh, high achievers, you know, uh, too much is given, much is required. Um, I think we, you know, experience more than others. You know, a lot of times we're young, we're from impoverished communities and we're thrusted into the patriarch of the family. That's a struggle in itself. I think a lot of times, you know, we're judged on how much we weigh, um, you know, how we look, you know, our appearance, you know, and so that's always tough to deal with. Uh, now we have social media, so you can hear all, you can, you know, go on your phone and see all these negative comments about yourself, or you could be having a, a meal and get a phone flash in your face. So yeah, I do think that, you know, um, uh, high achievers in particular, famous people have more to deal with than the average person. Um, I, I enjoy not being famous more than I enjoy fame. You know, I get so much more peace of mind, so much, such a much easier experience. Fame is a very tough thing to deal with. And not only fame, fame, comp um, and you compound that with money, you know, and youth, that's a very dangerous antidote, you know. So thanks for that question. Thank you. Kind of going off that, you mentioned youth and money and being thrown into the spotlight. Do you think there's anything specific to rookies or younger players that the NBA could be doing? Because in our education system, for example, we're not really taught about a lot of the skills that we need to succeed, especially in those situations. Right. Are there plans to introduce any type of education or like mentoring program? Yeah, well, we have several programs, okay. you know. Um, I think that, well, I'll speak for the NBA Players Association. I think we do about 40 different programs. We have everything from broadcast to leadership, which is, you know, uh, training for if you want to go into the front office. Um, we have a transition program that's helping guys in their transition. We just started the mental health program. We have career development. Um, we have the programming. You know, the programming and the infrastructure is in place. Um, the key is to make sure that the guys get it while they're still in the game. Mm -hmm. um, you know, help. That's the key. A lot of times guys wait to the, it's the end of their career to try and start building themselves up and preparing for the next phase of life. And I think if we can get them to, um, start developing themselves earlier, I think that transition will be, you know, a lot more smooth. Yeah. Well, you're on top of it. We have another live question. Thank you so much for being here today. Um, so going back to the work of your foundation, you talked about working with children, and I'm a new mom, and so I was wondering, what are techniques that you use, maybe even with your own family or with yeah. the children, to promote and, like, um, create and foster an environment so that your children feel like you're taking care of them. Oh, thank you, Fasten. I had to lean in on that one because, <laughs> man, it's all about the kids, man, you know, and I think we can stop this vicious cycle uh, on their watch. Um, I would say the first thing is that I think we make um, conversations around our bodies too hard, you know, and I would say normalizing that conversation. You know, when I talk to my kids about their bodies, you know, their private parts. I tell them, you know, hey, this is your private part. This is your body. Daddy shouldn't touch you there. Mommy shouldn't touch you there. This is your body, you know? And if anybody ever touches you in that way, you have to let me know so that mommy and daddy can protect you. Um, conversations, you know, uh, hey, this is healthy conversations. 
You know, don't let anybody talk to you about your body or if somebody says something that's offensive or cursing or something like that, babe, you can always talk to me. I think it's just really about communicating. And then also watching, you know, because a lot of times when a kid is going through something, you'll see some behavioral changes, whether they're aggressive or whether they're aloof, um, you know, and just being in tune with your kids, you know, asking them questions, how are you doing, you know, uh, looking at their bodies, you know, from time to time, making sure that, oh, you got a bruise on your leg. Oh, you know, mama see everything. Come on, let's put some Neosporin on it or whatever the case may be. But just really, you know, uh, empowering them to be able to communicate with you. The, w the worst thing that I did was internalize it at seven years old. See, I ran the tape in my head. I couldn't tell my dad because I didn't know what he would do. Like when he go back and he would get revenge. I couldn't tell my mom because I just didn't know how to. I couldn't share with my siblings because uh, I didn't want them to think anything of me. I couldn't tell my friends because I didn't want them to think my manhood was gone. And so I decided to, you know, internalize it, you know? And like that wasn't the healthy way to do it. I could have lost my life by internalizing that. And so uh, thank you for asking, uh, asking that question. I think it's very healthy to communicate with your kids in an honest way. Um, and don't sugarcoat it because the world is a very cruel place and the people who are out there being predators, they are aggressive to try and get it done. And so I think we have to be just as aggressive or proactive, you know, uh, against their aggression towards our kids. Thank you. Thank you for asking. Great. Another live question. Hi. Hi. Um, you touched on some of this a bit, but like playing sports and especially at the professional level can definitely cause mental challenges, whether it's the fame or, you know, your paycheck relies on how well you play. Um, and you said the NBA had some programming available, but I was wondering if the NBA as a whole or any specific teams kind of proactively reached out to the players and said, these are some challenges you might be facing. Here are good ways to deal with it. Yeah. Yeah. Good question. Um, I think I think each team, you know, has resources in place and has, you know, some teams might be further ahead um, in their development of, you know, programs around helping guys than others. But I would say, like, our league has great resources. Um, we have, I believe every team now has a mental health specialist that they work with. Um, I believe every, uh, uh, I believe every um, team also has uh, a player development coordinator um, who can kind of, you know, be a liaison to help them get to all the resources. Um, the infrastructure is great in the NBA. It's just a matter of it's hard to do your work and develop yourself when you're trying to be excellent, you know, and trying to earn, you know, in this short window. Um, but I think this generation is changing. I see that these millennials are so much stronger than we give them credit for. Um, they speak their truth. They, they, they are very talented, a little entitled. <laughs> but, you know, I think this generation is bold, and I'm so proud of this generation. And I look forward to helping transfer information from one generation to the next um, so that they don't have to start all over with doing their work, like, so they can build off of this discussion about mental health and not have to start from ground level. Because I believe that in 10 years, mental health will be so normal that, you know, I believe like a great part of people will just, you know, you know, be advocates for it. It'll be normal the same way, you know, um, you know, getting physical therapy is. Yeah, absolutely. So thanks for the question. Thank you. I love these questions. Thank you for asking questions. <laughs> Hi, thank you for the very uh, open discussion. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Um, back to the uh, topic about kids. Um, does the Respect Foundation have any sort of therapy programs for, let's say, like if you were uh, seven years old, you had no one to reach out to, but if there had been like some kind of therapy program that maybe you could have reached out to um, as a kid, maybe you wouldn't have had to internalize it when you had no one else to turn to because of the stigma of what you went through and the shame that you felt, even though it wasn't your fault. <laughs> That happens. Right. Um, but can you speak to that, like therapy yeah. programs for kids? Yeah, so our main program right now is called the I Am Respect Tour. And like I said earlier, we bring music, entertainment, spoken word, a DJ. Um, but the content that we deliver is very conscious. 
um, and it's around mental health and sexual abuse and how to prevent it. Um, I'm not a therapist, so I can't do that work myself. I'm a life coach. Um, so we haven't grown and evolved to that, 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 that point where we can you know, uh, you know, send kids to therapy. Um, but what we do is we raise awareness around it. We've touched probably about 10,000 kids in the last four years. And in doing that, we connect them with the resources that they do have access to. And so if you have access in the community, we usually partner with an organization um, that has great infrastructure resources, um, but we don't provide the resources ourselves. We kind of use our network um, to be able to help people. Right, that makes sense, thank you. Thank you. We have another question from online, again from Dan, big fan. The Kawhi <laughs> Leonard injury has shown us that when the team and players seek different medical opinions, drama and disagreement can occur. How do you anticipate handling similar situations involving mental health? What if a player's therapist disagrees with the team psychologist about his ability to play? Oh, that's a good one. And I think we had, you know, um, we've been dealing with that issue around the NBA for quite some time. There was a high profile case um, of a draft pick uh, uh, probably about five or six years ago who had uh, a phobia around flying. And so there, there, I'm sure that, you know, there's going to be a learning curve, you know, as we try and get this system worked out. Um, but I believe the hearts and the minds are in the right place. I think we're still learning about mental health. Um, and so I don't have a definite answer to that right now. Um, but I do believe that that's something that, you know, will come up at some point or another. And there's going to be people who are higher pedigree than me who will be able to handle that. <laughs> well, it's comforting to know that you'll be in the conversation because you are definitely, uh, your head and heart are definitely in the right Thank place. You. Um, another one, Becky in San Francisco asks, what is the best way to support a friend or family member who has suffered from childhood abuse? Oh, um, Becky, I'm so sorry your family member or your friend had, had to endure that. Um, I've been there, so I know how that is. You know, the, the thing about abuse is like, not only does it hurt the victim, but it hurts the infrastructure around the victim because there's a certain guilt that might be associated with the parents, right? Oh, maybe I didn't protect it. Oh, what could I have done differently? Um, there are siblings who like, man, I would have ran through a wall for you. I couldn't protect you. I would say the, the most important thing that you do is love them, love on them. You know, let them know that it's okay. Um, try and help them get to the resources because you have to do your work. If you don't do your work, you really open yourself up to these behaviors. You know, these, these behaviors that could be very, very detrimental to your health. Um, and so the first thing, love on them. Let them know, you know, support them. Help them get to the resources. Let them know that you understand. Sometimes, you know, you don't have to say anything. Sometimes you just gotta be there and just smile. Let them know, you're, you're, hey, I'm here for you whenever you wanna talk. Um, do preventative things, go and check on them, you know, uh, spend some time with that person. Um, maybe go to a group session with them, mm -hmm. you know, I, I think that is also good, you know, when your support system supports you in those group sessions, that, that's helpful as well. But just knowing that they trust you to be able to talk about it, just continuously, you know, check in with them, make sure that, they, that, um, that they're okay. Because, you know, a lot of times flashbacks can come back, you know, uh, you can smell something that might take you back to a place, you can see something that might take you to a place, you can hear something that could take you back to a place, and those flashbacks are real. Mm -hmm. And a part of my PTSD, when the abuse was coming back, I was trying to push it down. And that confliction, I believe, is where my mind really started to race. Mm -hmm. And that's a dangerous place to be. So, um, you know, just making sure that they're, they have the resources and they feel supported is important. None of us have all the answers, but it's important just to show up for our friends and family. We are at the hour, so we'll um, end here, but I do have one burning question for Okey you. Dope. Who do you think is gonna win tonight? Celtics or Cavs? <sighs> so I'm a Celtic fan, I play for the Celtics. That's the organization that helped save my life, but I believe the Celtics are on the road tonight and the home team has won every game in this series. And so I will say tonight, I believe the Cavs will get them. All right, well, <laughs> what about tomorrow? Live question. I'm sorry, I can neither. Warriors versus Rockets. <laughs> no, I believe the home team will win that game as well tomorrow. All right, seven game series all the way. Well, Keon, thank you so much for sharing your story, 
all the work that you're doing you. and coming here today. You have so much going on. We are so appreciative of you spending your time with us. No problem. So thank, thank you. you. Um, and I'm excited to see everything else that you do. Thank you. Thank you, MJ. Great job.